digital health opportunities for engaging patients and improving outcomes. Okay, Heidi, we are ready for you. Please start. All right. Let me share my screen here. Yeah, I used to travel globally, but then COVID happened and, and now I do everything from uh, my own home. <laughs> Everyone at the same. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's both good and um, confusing because when you're, when you're there in person, you get to be in the same time zone. When you're not there in person, <laughs> you, your day gets very long. Yeah. Um, but thank you for the, the introduction and it's really wonderful to participate in the cardiology web webinar. Uh, as um, stated in my, my intro, I come to you with the lived experience as a heart patient and that then collided with my professional experience as a technologist. So being able to bring these two worlds together um, has really been a good thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the heart of the possible and the improving opportunities for, for patient engagement through digital health. But I'm going to kind of start with a little bit on the background side. You know, why is this important to me? And what did I learn before digital health was even a thing? Uh, I... I was diagnosed back in 1982 with a rare heart arrhythmia. And in 1983, you know, had the, the AV ablation. But I grew up as a kid down in Southern California playing sports. I was a competitive swimmer, soccer player, ran cross country and track, you know, professional windsurfer and a competitive skier. But I never could figure out how to take my own pulse. So if you think about that, um, you know, in the, in the early 80s, there I am, a, a very athletic child, and I couldn't, when, you know, in PE or physical education, and, and the teacher would say, okay, you know, count your pulse for 20 seconds, come up with a number. I had no idea how kids came up with a, with a number, so I just would say whatever, you know, uh, you know, in the range of what other people were saying, because I was too embarrassed to say that I didn't know how to count my pulse. Well, Turns out when I was 18 years old and I was going in for knee surgery uh, to clean up the mess that I had made with all of the, the sports, had my first EKG as part of the pre-surgery preparations. And as the piece of paper came out of the machine and the technician's eyes got really large, we learned that 270 beats per minute is not normal. So while the physicians and my care team are kind of all, you know, surprised at this, um, I was relieved because now I understood, oh, look, that's why I couldn't count my heartbeats. Of course, in that moment, they canceled the heart, the, the knee surgery, sent me to the coronary care unit, and I spent the next 30 days at University of California, San Francisco, with teams of fellows, uh, physician fellows, cardiology fellows coming in to play guess the arrhythmia. And at the end of the 30 days and a number of different drug therapies that I wasn't responding to, uh, I was told that they hadn't quite ever seen the condition I was showing. They didn't know what to do with me next. They weren't sure why I had lived as long as I did. And they weren't sure how much longer I would be around. So as an 18 year old, that's kind of a lot to deal with. Uh, what I did is I then, you know, moved back to Maui to windsurf because as an 18 year old, if you're not going to live long, you should, you know, live really well. And the following year I came in and I was asked if I wanted to uh, participate in this experimental procedure, having an AV ablation. So in 1983, this was not the what we do today in cardioaversion with precision laser um, uh, ablations. This was DC current run up my, you know, our femoral artery. And, and then they just kind of took out the whole AV node. And at that point that left me a hundred percent pacemaker dependent. So, um, I don't have any underlying heart rate any, any longer, you know, my AV, my atrium works, but my ventricle, the connection between the atrium and the ventricle has been, uh, electrocuted or ablated. So imagine 
before social media, before many of the tools that we have today, I was trying to decide how the heck am I going to feel having a pacemaker put in? I'd spent my life as a competitive athlete. I'm 19 years old. I'm a professional windsurfer. I have no idea how I'm going to feel. Uh, I had a swimsuit sponsor and I'm trying to figure out whether or not I would ever wear a bathing suit again. And, and what exactly, like you have to remember the size of a pacemaker in 1983 was about the size of a pack of cigarettes sort of sticking out of your chest. And I had never seen a pacemaker in another person. Well, you know, I, I did the surgery and everything worked out well. Uh, the first the, the first pacemaker that I had had very clunky heartbeats. Uh, so fast forward to six pacemakers later, um, I now had an, a new thing to deal with. And this is the, the unintended consequences of being an early adopter of technology. One of the things that physicians and, and medical device manufacturers hadn't really thought through were the way that leads went into the heart. So they used to have sort of barbed hooks on the end and that was embedded in my heart muscle. But 20 years later, when the leads went bad, they didn't really have a good way of getting those out. Um, so after 13 hours of, of surgery, the leads be, becoming infected and they had to, to pull them out, but the, the hospital that I went to didn't know how to get them out, so they called another hospital. Anyway, all of that uh, left scar tissue that then began to block blood flow. So by 2010, I get the call from my physician, my cardiologist, that I'm going to need to go in for open heart surgery to go in and repair that vascular system where the scar tissue was now blocking blood flow. And you have to remember, even though I'd had a pacemaker since 1983, it was 2010 when I first thought about, am I really a heart patient? And the reason for that is think about the messaging around heart disease. There's nothing really hopeful. There's nothing inspirational. And for the most part, the patient is blamed for their disease and for making bad lifestyle choices. So I was born with a heart problem. I figured I was just a girl with a bad electrical system. We put in a pacemaker and I was fine. Well, now that they were going to go in and do open heart surgery and I was dealing with heart failure, I guess I had to, to decide I really am a heart patient. And then I had to think about how do you prepare for open heart surgery? In my mind, as an athlete, I decided that I would, before even going in for surgery, I would set a goal. And I think this is really important with where we are headed today in how do we engage patients by helping them think beyond what a procedure, just the, the procedure and recovering from the procedure, but helping them really think about what do you want to do and what will inspire you to choose to get well. And for me, I decided I was gonna be a competitive cyclist and I picked out a bike race called the Loda Jaw Classic. Then the day arrived. And for any of you that haven't also been a patient, this is the moment uh, that is probably the most frightening when you're going in to be prepared to go into surgery. But when they put that first IV in, because once the IV goes in, you can't leave anymore. You can't escape and it's really going to happen. The best part is within a few minutes, they give you the good drugs. And then, then all I remember is waking up, getting my celebratory heart pillow, everything was good. Everything was going really well. You know, I accomplished my first goal, you get from the bed to the, to the chair, woo. Um, unfortunately, that day three, we had some, uh, again, unintended consequences. And it turns out where they had rebuilt using donor aorta tissue to splice together my new vascular system, um, it was leaking. And I had poked a hole in my pleural skin into my lungs. So I bled out into my, my chest cavity and we got to have a code blue night where um, they had to use the high performance transfusion machine to fill me back up. 
And so this was day one of training for my bike race back in the ICU. And not necessarily what I had intended, but I did get a whole body of new blood. Um, you know, this idea though of having a goal and having a plan, and this will get into why we are in such interesting times with digital health, because, you know, I did this intuitively based on my background as an athlete recovering from heart issues. But many patients don't know how to set the goal, have the tools and the information and the data to be able to actually execute against that goal. So I had already set the goal for a bike race, but I had to start with, like I said, getting out of the bed and into the chair, getting from the chair to the door, walking laps at the hospital. I was in the hospital for three weeks after that surgery and then the, the unintended consequences, but getting to where I could walk one lap of the hospital floor, then to being able to do you know a total of morning laps, afternoon laps and evening laps so that when I could get out of the hospital, I did my very first four minute spin bike ride. And today thinking about doing a four minute workout, that's hardly worth putting your shoes on for. But when you're a heart patient who's just had her chest cut open and you're looking for a way back to feeling like you again, that four minutes was amazing. And it was really hard and it was really frightening. But four minutes got me to 10 minutes, got me to 20 minutes to getting back on my, my mountain bike first because I figured if I was riding on the, the, the dirt, a car wouldn't hit me and squish me. Then at two, mile, two, uh, two months after surgery, I was able to do my first 10 mile bike event, five months, I crossed the finish line of my 50, first 50 mile um, bike race. That was the goal that I had set going into surgery. And my one year anniversary to open heart surgery, I did my first um, 100 mile century ride. And at 18 months, I did an entire 200 mile single day bike race that goes from Logan, Utah to Jackson Hole, Wyoming over three mountain passes. And for me, crossing that finish line meant that I wasn't broken anymore. I didn't have to live life as a victim. I had the choice to choose to get well, set goals and accomplish those goals by having the right information and data that I could share with my physicians, my coaches, and in the context of what I was doing each day. So since that, that open heart surgery in 2010 and my first bike race that I, I crossed the finish line on, I've since then done the, the 200 mile single day bike race six times, moved on to racing gravel bikes and then mountain bike stage races around the world. And you know, for me, it was like, okay, I've, I've had a successful outcome but now how do we help other people, other heart patients have the same motivation, tools, and information? So if we think about what patient data does a person need in order to make better choices? And oftentimes those choices are how to just set goals, change behavior, and improve outcomes. So you have to start with in my case, and many of the heart patients that I work with through Tour to Heart, is the number one thing that they want to be able to do is trust their, their body again. You know, it's, it's medical device manufacturers and my cardiologists and my care team, they don't often think about the number one step I need to do, which is I have to trust my body again. I have to trust that the device in my chest is actually going to work and realize that my life depends on it working. And so there's a whole period of time that you have to actually deal with the mental side of, of trusting your body, trusting the device. You know, I spent a long time before I had access to wearables that I can, you know, put on my wrist to counting my heartbeats. You know, is it working? Is it working? Is it working? And, and that can paralyze you with a type of fear. So finding ways 
to have data to stop feeling fearful because once you aren't afraid and you feel safe, then you have the confidence to do more. And it was that rewiring my thought process of knowing that I'm safe, having more confidence and doing even more. So that journey of getting from, you know, intensive care with a, you know, open heart surgery and many pacemakers to being able to train and cross the finish line for Ironman, racing, you know, fat bikes in the snow and, and, and open water swimming, that took a lot of learning to feel safe and having confidence. And the way that I do that with the data that I can collect is I have both the remote patient monitoring tools. So the latitude communicator, which is the passive um, remote patient monitor that, that connects to my pacemaker and can, you know, kind of give a thumbs up that everything is, is okay. It's reduced the need for going into the clinic for pacemaker checks. As often, I, you know, when, and in this time of COVID, having that ability to do telemedicine and remote management really made life easier. And because I'm in r rural Idaho, out in the middle of nowhere, um, it's a two hour drive to get to the cardiologist. So that side of, of where we're going with digital health and remote patient management and real time um, device uh, status and connecting with my physicians is really important. But the part of me that's training as an athlete, being able to go into the human performance lab and doing VO2 max and lactate threshold and, and, and power thresholds while having my pacemaker tech rep in there optimizing my device. Because again, my pacemaker is the, the most important piece of performance equipment I have as an athlete. And my wearables, you know, I, I have a Garmin uh, wearable that I have on one wrist and I wear an Apple watch on the other um, to collect different types of data and performance data. Many patients talk about, you know, getting access to the data from their, their pacemakers. Um, I do quite a bit of work with Boston Scientific. And so I do have an opportunity to, to see what the data collected in the, from my remote patient monitor, what that looks like. And so thinking about how do we make this useful, I think this is an opportunity for industry to work more directly with patients to see if there aren't ways to collect insights or data um, biomarkers that will become more of use to make behavior changes for the patient. Because if you see this data, it's like, well, that's interesting, but most important, what's my end of life for the battery? Um, I know there's other things that I would love to see, and um, I'm hoping that we can get to where we can see, make that more useful. And, you know, when we look at the types of data that a patient can now go and and create or have access to about their specific body, we can go get our genome sequenced. I've had mine done. And you starting with the point that I already knew that I had heart issues, um, having my genome sequenced and looking at the different variants, um, we found that a significant amount of my, my variants were around cardiovascular in particular, uh, electro, uh, electrophysiology type issues, which I think is kind of interesting. So from a, an opportunity to donate data, to improve research, to engage patients in many different ways in clinical trials, I think that we can begin to bring a, a lot of data into the conversation. Um, and again, the, the data that I have and can, you know, for use in my, my daily life, along with what I then can also use to communicate with my physician via telemedicine and things like that. Here's what the Apple Watch takes in a 30 second EKG that I can, it goes directly to my phone, it saves as a PDF, and I can, you know, email that to my physician. This is when I'm having really pretty little heartbeats. But you can see there are some times when I'm having heartbeats that, you know, are 
having issues. And I can feel that. And so being able to collect this in, you know, as it's happening um, is, and, and share that with my physician becomes really useful because we can then take that and make decisions on what tests or what do we need to do next. Um, patients and people helping one another through mobile app data and social sharing. There are now so many mobile apps that help us to collect and, and use data, whether it's how we wanna manage the food we eat. For me, um, as an athlete, I'm very interested in Strava because I, I can longitudinally look at, since 2011, when I started training, I can look at segments and performance metrics. And when I am now prescribed a new uh, pharmaceutical or arrhythmia management drug, I can determine best time of day and how I feel and what that does to performance based on comparing it to past um, activities that I've done. And then sharing information with my coaches and then looking at the detailed type um, data that I can get from my Garmin on heart rate power and things like that. But we're beginning to see how there's a tremendous amount of data that individuals can generate. And uh, this chart here, where we look at, you know, what are the, comp what are the components of digital health as viewed by the FDA? and I'm very involved with the FDA's new Digital Health Center of Excellence, we can start to look at a path forward of you know, the wireless medical devices, mobile apps becoming a regulated medical device, different health IT platforms, data systems, telemedicine, which during COVID has become a very important tool for delivering care in new ways and supporting underserved communities. And, and diversity communities. Um, software as a medical device and just the, the wellness, uh, wellness tools that are, are now being developed. Until recently, all, many of these things were just considered consumer tools and healthcare teams didn't really take them seriously. But now that the FDA and we're seeing the improvement in the algorithms that are available and we're seeing the insights that can be pro provided, they're now being the, the pathways to regulatory approval to make this part of the actual um, care plan for diagnosis. And so if we think about in general patient journeys today, as we are transforming from the old paradigm of a patient going into a physician and the physician knows everything, we're now moving into the model of a consumer and the consumer now has choice. And I thought this was really interesting. Again, I, I come from many years at Google and looking at Google search as the beginning of many patient journeys. Um, a person will go to begin to, to research um, in, and look for information either based on symptoms that they are, are experiencing or they've been given a diagnosis and they want to learn more. So for physicians, physicians now are dealing with a either much more educated patient or a person who has read only the worst case scenario and now they need to kind of be able to, to talk that person back to reality. And I was giving a talk in, in Switzerland uh, in January, 2020. And I thought it was very interesting that the, um, the infograph that came up and a question I was asked is, do you turn to Google for medical advice more often than your physician? We're beginning to see a, many people are starting with a Google search. They're looking for information and oftentimes they're finding solutions to simple things. Um, and treating themselves in, in a self-care journey versus uh, going to their physician. Which brings us to this interesting uh, collision of and transformation of going from the healthcare industry where patients are 
kind of things are done to us to becoming the, the retail reality of being a consumer and looking at the holistic journey of health and wellness. And digital health is really driving a lot of this. When you can go into a retail establishment and, and begin to make behavior choices that are based on your wellness decisions uh, and using information to, to make those choices, we're beginning to see that the patients are people and people are consumers with choice. And there's also this idea that, that people want more personal accountability. Waiting in line um, or with COVID where going to the physician or going to the clinic or the doctor was not easy anymore. There, it oftentimes took a, you know, a, a wait time, people didn't feel safe. So this idea that you can begin to engage with different technologies, look for information on websites, leveraging the, the mobile phone or the doctor, <laughs> the doctor in your pocket, um, accessing electronic health records to look at um, lab results and things like that, sharing on social media, engaging with wearable technologies, we're really beginning to see that patients are engaging because they have access to tools. And if they want to you know, take on the responsibility, they then have the, the freedom to have more accountability. And this then gets to one of the areas that, that healthcare is beginning to look at, and especially the work that I do in the cardiovascular medical device space, this idea that the product life cycle you know, we think about healthcare and the development of pharmaceutical and, and medical device products. We have healthcare services and solutions. And oftentimes these are all developed without talking to or engaging their target audience, which is the patient. And then they wonder why patients aren't engaging or aren't being compliant with the therapies and the, the solutions they've developed. And to be honest, oftentimes it's because what was designed and, and, and created isn't really relevant to the, the life a patient lives. So bringing these two, um, the patient life cycle and the product life cycle together, that it starts at the, the, the patient journey starts with the diagnosis of symptoms. And then there's some sort of therapy, surgery or procedure. And you have to remember that, that when that happens to a person, that's the beginning of a new life. You're, you're not the same person you were before you had these things done. And so realizing that you're changing somebody's uh, personal roadmap when you implant a device, when you diagnose them with, with cardiovascular disease, when you perform an ablation or something like that, that now changes the, the individual's um, rest of their life. They then have to go to the next phase of learning to monitor, manage, and adjust, um, trusting their body, learning, you know, what, what is your new normal? What do you need to be aware of? And what's just part of everything being okay? And just about the time you get used to managing your device, you know what to expect and everything is good, you are now time to get a new device because you've reached end of life or there's some sort of recall or you have other complications that then lead to a new device. So what is often lost in, in my personal experience, again, having seven different pacemakers is the going from one device to the next. There's oftentimes not a great fit between the, the you know, the space that the first pacemaker that was really large, then they put in the next one that was really small, the pocket didn't adapt. And so the pacemaker slid under my armpit. Well, now we got to take that one out and put a new one in. Um, so there's just these things like, and again, the, the lead extraction, you know, today they, they've redeveloped leads so that they kind of twist into the heart muscle. They're still, you know, they stay nice and tight where they're supposed to be, but after the heart muscle has grown around it for 20 years, they can still slide out instead of those barbed hooks being stuck and tearing the heart muscle up. So, you know, this idea that you can engage the patient 
early in the process as you design projects, the lessons learned so that you, those unintended consequences can be lessened or really thought about before they become a crisis. And that's where that patient input in the research and product development is becoming um, really important. I do quite a bit of work, quite a bit of work and consulting with the Medical Device Innovation Consortium on their science of patient input. And for anyone that's really interested in some fabulous white papers and, and collaborations that we've been doing with the FDA, mdic.org has some really great resources for industry providers and, and medical device companies on this idea of engaging the patient through the total product life cycle. Um, and you know, that's they're really looking at how they can start to address and align the patient life cycle and the product life cycle for better uh, devices. And I just, you know, I, I included a couple of these um, feedback quotes from patients that have filled out a survey that I have on tourtoheart.com or yeah, tourtoheart.com. And it's interesting to hear what they think about their new life with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular devices. And there's a lot of anxiety and fear about not knowing what do I do if it runs out? Um, all the, the broken leads, you know, why is that happening? And the number of surgeries they need to go in and have. Uh, as they get older, you know, things that, that didn't bother them as when they were younger as a child, but now not understanding potential side effects, how do we uh, relieve some of that fear and anxiety of living with devices um, and many devices year after year for the rest of your life? And then really just how do we help people, you know, get the, the information and have the dialogue with their cardiologist so they can begin to feel better about their, their journey. And this gets to the, you know, bridging the gap between phys patients and physicians. You know, there is a big issue in the misaligned success metrics. Think about healthcare as an industry and you know your, your cardiology patients and the way that you deliver care, the definition of success is the patient was diagnosed correctly and, and in a timely manner, the procedure therapy or surgery was done without complications, the person left the hospital and they didn't uh, return or readmit in 30 days that's considered a success. The industry gets a, you know, a gold star and everyone's happy. But if you ask that patient, what was their definition of success? Again, it's the, when did I stop being afraid? When did I feel like I had the information and the tools to re-engage in a life that was worth living? There's a big gap there. So this idea of, of you know, really helping to develop programs to better align the success metrics Right now, not just managing the crisis, the fee for service, but looking at the person journey. How do you start the conversation with a patient by asking them what are their goals? What is their vision of a, a happy, healthy life? And then building their healthcare plan around that. And you know, the that gets into the healthcare system is not designed to coach patients back to, to the life they want, but what options does the healthcare system have to refer patients to programs to begin that, that journey back to their happy life? Because there really isn't a billing code, at least here in the US, we don't have a billing code for happiness. And so happiness isn't measured. Um, and this is the, the work in the opportunities for advocacy, you know, starting with that uh, providing hopeful and information, uh, inspirational success stories. Because if we don't inspire people to choose to get well, no amount of great healthcare is going to get them, get them back to healthy. Providing that idea of, you know, and guidance on setting a goal you know, if you start the conversation with what is your vision and what are your goals, 
you know, to your new life, you know, what makes you feel like you're, you would be happy and successful. How do we help them set those goals? Because the patient really does need to own that plan and they need to feel empowered. And this is again, where digital health tools and wearables and, and information and insights empower them to set that goal and be able to um, successfully execute on that journey. And then just really understanding that this is for the rest of my life. I will never not be powered by pacemakers. Um, and so that relationship that at some point, you know, I'm 37 years into this, I've got a pretty good idea of what a body feels like running on batteries. Um, and, you know, again, from the, the, the patient survey that, that uh, I've, I've gotten, been collecting feedback on, and I just wanted to reach out to other patients and, and confirm, like, do you ever feel scared or overwhelmed dealing with your heart issues? Look at how many people between the yes and sometimes are pretty concerned about having a cardiovascular device or dealing with cardiovascular issues. We can, we, there's a lot of opportunity to make people or help patients feel better and less frightened and overwhelmed. And this idea of, you know, do people feel like they can be as active as they were before the diagnosis, their cardiovascular diagnosis or procedure? Again, lots of people, a majority of them don't feel like they can live the life they had before or they don't feel safe. So how can we re-engage these, these um, patients that are working on going back to being happy people? How can we help them have the same level of activity and feel safe doing it? Um, people are beginning to use Fitbits and Garmins and, and um, wearables so that they can have those insights to make the appropriate behavior changes and, and be compliant with whatever their cardiovascular rehab care plan is. And so between the number of people that are currently using devices that are connected to mobile apps or are interested, again, how can the healthcare system and cardiology begin to leverage these connected engaged patients in providing better care and understanding how they're interpreting the data? And I just think that, you know, those conversations and those opportunities to engage, when you ask a heart patient, what do you wish you had known? Or what do you wish you had had access to before you'd gone in uh, to have your procedure? And so again, these are very, very much low hanging fruit opportunities to make a difference. But the, if you think about the role that social media can begin to play, how um, engaging online and presenting information in a written in a patient voice uh, can become, can really start to address some of these um, topics that, that people wish they had known. And so much of it really is on the psychological and the mental journey that patients don't realize they're going to need to take on in order to get back to a place that they can feel safe and re-engage with life. So as we think about what are some of these drivers, you know, in this world we live in now, post-COVID or almost post-COVID, there's this realization that healthcare executives acknowledge that technology is becoming very much a part of the human experience. And patients are humans. So by default, it's like this is technology is a part of the patient experience. So, you know, and if, if consumers are beginning to be, feel safe and, and that their data is, you know, being, and privacy is all being um, taken care of, we're beginning to see more adoption by the, the patient consumer or, you know, person. So these two things are driving the adoption and the use of, of digital health tools to continue to improve the, the care delivery options and the clinical research opportunities and, and, and the many different uh, improvements to you know, meaningful healthcare outcomes. 
but as healthcare leaders, as physicians, um, researchers, and uh, medical device companies and pharmaceutical companies, what are some of those uh, opportunities to, to take on to really move the, continue to move the digital health and, and technology adoption with patients? And it, it starts with personalizing the experience. You know, we used to get one size fits all healthcare, but now when you bring the, um, the patient into the conversation as a co-collaborator and you leverage the data that is now being collected across, <clears throat> across their patient journey, you can now personalize it, but in a cost-effective way and at scale. So I think that's gonna be very, really important. And then just the idea that you are empowering the consumer with data that they can be accountable and own those experiences. And that then helps them be a co-creator co or co-collaborator with their physician and their care team, much more engaged and they're much more willing to be compliant because the plan is developed around what's important to them with insights that they can generate and they can be accountable for using and then using data as the common language to communicate between the patient and the physician instead of today, the way that a, a patient goes in and communicates with, well, here's how I feel. Feelings are really difficult to treat for a physician. So if you can use data and insights with you know, how the symptom felt as a component of, of that discussion, but I think that that's going to be an area of, of patient empowerment. And then really just looking at this isn't going away, thinking forward and what does future success look like? What are going to be additional opportunities? And, you know, health, I've been talking about digital health and patient, uh, patient driven outcomes for gosh, since 1998, when I started using my polar heart rate monitor to, to collect insights. And it's only been in the last couple of years that the industry has finally decided to take notice. It's like, well, guess what? It's happening whether healthcare likes it or not. So really beginning to, to think about the future, how can we be successful as you know, entire stakeholders represented in the design development and, and driving the, uh, the, the future outcome opportunities. And so uh, really just as, as final thoughts, I've been living this journey for 37 years. I've had the opportunity to work in the industry side of one at Google in how do we build out the platforms and the infrastructure to ingest data, transform it, make it useful and present it to stakeholders. And now the work that I'm doing um, through Tour to Heart with the FDA here in the US and the Medical Device Innovation Consortium, it's an amazing opportunity to, to take the implantable wearable and environmental data that we can now collect and really make it useful in improving clinical trials, outcomes, and just engaging with other patients to help them on their journeys. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, that's kind of about it. Hopefully that was interesting and, and useful. Thank you so much, Heidi. It was very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I'd like Heidi. to ask her. Sure. Yeah. Can I ask her one question? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, good morning, doctor. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to <laughs> meet you. Our, you did a wonderful presentation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm from Brazil. I'm not cardiologist, but I did the two presentation prior to your presentation, okay. and I I said something about energy in the treatment of cardiology problems in my presentation about uh, congested heart failure and okay. about uh, myocardial infarction without arterial obstruction. 
In both presentations, I said something about energy. And energy is not um, studied by Western medicine, but by traditional Chinese medicine. Yes. Uh, but they are in our body. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was, when you, you said in my presentation, 